All right, everybody. Hello. Welcome to this webinar today. Thank you for joining us for this Code Jumper presentation. Today, we're going to roll the dice. Uh, selection and random with Code Jumper is the title of this webinar. Again, it's roll the dice, selection and random with Code Jumper. Thank you for joining us for this webinar today. We're going to teach you a lot about the functions of Code Jumper and many different things that it can do, and one of the particular lessons. And we're going to get started with our opening poll questions. Betsy, I'm going to push those up for us now. Thank you for doing that. Okay, so let's ask the questions we like to ask. We always want to know who's with us. So please tell us your job title. We want to know where you are from and how you heard about the webinar. And then along with that are a couple of content related questions. We want to know if you have a Code Jumper kit with you today. You don't have to, but it's good to know if you do. So your choices here are yes, and I'm playing along. Yes, but I don't have it with me or no. And then we also want to know if you'll rate your comfort level providing instruction in coding. Are you not at all comfortable? Are you somewhat comfortable? Are you very comfortable? And then finally, this one's a little bit different. Uh, on a scale of one to five, how important do you think STEM slash STEAM instruction is for all students? If you pick one, you would say it's not important. On up to two, three is somewhat important. Four or five is very important. So anywhere along that scale of one to five, if you'll make that selection, we would appreciate that. And as you answer those poll questions, let me introduce you to some of the things you need to know to get started with this webinar today. Uh, please put your questions in the chat. It should be open at least through most of the webinar. We we'll should be able to keep it open. If it's off, it'll be only off for a very short period of time. Uh, one and a half hours ACV REP credit. Betsy Ann will give you that code shortly. We do have closed captioning available as well. So please take advantage of that. Joining us today, we have two uh, presenters. First, Joe Hodge, our Technical Innovations Product Manager at APH. Also joining us today, Jim Sullivan, the Director of Social Enterprise at APH. Uh, so two APH presenters today. Uh, let's talk about some challenges, some things that maybe you have to deal with and uh, see if these sound familiar at all to you. Keeping all students engaged and including them in STEM and STEAM lessons, it can be very difficult for many, many reasons. Uh, teachers need ways to instruct students who learn through different modalities. We just went through Learn Your Way, our annual meeting. Talked a lot about that. That's an extremely important concept for this webinar today as well. Uh, getting comfortable teaching subjects that are new and unfamiliar uh, requires teachers to educate themselves outside of the classroom, do their own research, figure out things that maybe they're not familiar with. And finding lesson plans that align with academic standards saves time and resources, it makes things a lot easier on the educator. Let's go into our learning objectives. So we're going to describe two ways physical programming teaches the concept of if, then, else. We'll explain how a braille reader creates a table in a computer science journal. We'll compare two ways to explain the concept of random values in a code jumper lesson. It's good to be uh, with you all. And of course, Joe's here. Joe, do you want to say hello to the crowd? Hello, everyone. Good morning. All right. And we also have a visitor today with us, and that's John Carr, who is a, a member of our, our uh, APH team. Uh, John, you want to say hello to everybody? Hello, everyone. And John, just, uh, we've invited uh, John to join us. John's going to be helping out with some some webinars down the road. But John, you want to describe to the audience what your your background is, what you what you studied in school? I studied computer science at Indiana University Southeast. And I'm currently a programmer here at APH, and I work on the mobile applications. Super, yeah. So as, as we move through the day, we want to encourage you to, to jump in, and um, you'll see some questions coming into the chat. So if you feel comfortable answering those questions, please go ahead and do that. So welcome, John. It's good to have you here with us. And, uh, and so as we start, um, one of the things that I want to sort of remind everybody is, is that Joe and I are here to really sort of model 
the the code jumper tool and the lesson. So what do I mean by model? Uh, we'll, we'll explain some concepts and what code jumper is for those of you who maybe aren't so familiar with it. We'll get into some detail about what the the uh, play pods with the hub and what the software does. Uh, but we are actually going to go into one of the lessons. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the lesson and we'll do an offline activity. And then we'll do uh, what's referred to as a guided activity and, and we'll process that. So for those of you who have a kit, it'll be an opportunity for you to plug in and, and join us with that. For those of you who don't have a kit, uh, we are still going to ask you to sort of play along with the uh, quote unquote reindeer games. And, and that is to you know, follow what it is that we're doing and then, and then chime in, so to speak. Uh, we will probably use almost the entire hour and a half. It's likely we will finish up a little bit early, but we'll be going uh, further into that uh, that last half an hour than than we uh, would be to the top half of that last half an hour. So, so as we get started with this, uh, and when we do these modeling, we like to bring up uh, concepts and talk about them throughout the course of the uh, the session. And so, I wanted to bring up this idea of physical. Uh, programming and, and what is physical programming? What are some of the advantages and, and what are some of the disadvantages? And so physical programming is creating a computer program or cre creating computer programs by manipulating objects. And that is what, what's referred to as computationally aware objects. So that object could be something, for instance, like a, a robot, for instance. Um, in an environment, a computing environment. And so that is telling that robot or that object to do something like to go forward or to go backwards or to go sideways. And, uh, and so there are a lot of advantages to this physical programming that takes place. And, and one of those is, is the, the entry level in there because they, they are often built in such a way that they are it can be error-free experiences is, is the entry level can be quite young. So you see uh, many physical programming type tools that are used by younger students. Um, and that those programs really allow the kids to be creative, like, you know, telling the robot to go do something or building some sort of little multimedia, uh, 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 some sort of multimedia experience that the kids can, can play back and listen to. Uh, there's lots of opportunity for open-ended exploration. So once the kids uh, learn some aspects of, of using the object in that environment, uh, they could take that and go in many different directions with it. Um, and as I, as I mentioned, it also allows you to involve a lot more students in, in the process uh, because of that idea of, again, that error-free experience. So, so physical computing is, is not anything new and it's probably pervasive in many of the schools in which you're involved with. But there are some limitations to it when we talk about working with uh, uh, students uh, who uh, may have a disability. So a student who maybe is visually impaired or a student uh, who uh, maybe has some sort of orthopedic issue. And, um, and specifically for our kids who are blind or visually impaired, uh, for those often uh, to work with these physical uh, programming tools, they need to be made accessible. Uh, and that's often done with a screen reader. And so uh, for a student to start very early on, they need knowledge of that screen reader. And uh, in order to have knowledge of a screen reader, they need to have touch typing skills. Uh, they also need to have a, a significant memory because of the steps that are involved. There's a lot of things that they would have to be able to sort of put in and then follow along and sort of remember how, to, how many to go back or how many to go forward. Uh, and that oftentimes, sometimes the, the kids at a younger age maybe don't have some of the uh, conceptual cognitive structures that are, are necessary to sort of think through however many steps or to uh, really sort of visualize or see or experience whatever it is that they're doing so far forward. So, so nevertheless, there, there are challenges uh, with these uh, programs, despite the fact that, um, that they are there for uh, really starting off at, a, at an early age. So, so we're going to uh, talk then about really some of the principles that were uh, behind the design of CodeJumper specifically, and then we'll ask a question. So when the developers of, of 
the Code Jumper tool got together and they thought about what they wanted to go into it. One of the things that they decided was is that there needed to be what was referred to as persistent program overview. And that was at any point in time, the students that were working with the programs that they were created, they could really at any point in time, really see, feel everything that was that was going on with it. There was There would be no need to sort of remember uh, two or three steps, but rather to put their hands on and to feel all the parts of the code. Another uh, design principle was this principle of liveness, that there was an immediate reaction or, or something happened immediately when something was turned or twisted or plugged in. That a uh, code jumper needed to have a low floor and a high ceiling. Uh, in other words, the concepts that they were working on related to computational thinking, they needed to start out at the very basic, but they needed to go far beyond into things like we're going to talk about today, which is the concept of random. Uh, the, the, pro, the, the, the tool needed to work across all visual abilities. And so they wanted to make sure that it was inclusive, uh, regardless of whether the individual uh, was fully sighted had low vision or was blind. And the last element of this was enabling progression. That is what they were learning in CodeJumper they would be able to take on with them in the future. So we wanna ask a question and that question um, Paul will bring up now. And, and we realize that all of these are important. All five of these are important, but we're, we're gonna ask is what's your opinion about which of the ones is the most important? And so with that, I'm gonna advance the slide. I'm gonna turn this back to Paul to ask our question. All right, thank you. So uh, Betsy Ann, if you'll put that poll question up for everybody, please. We just wanna know, again, this is your opinion, as Sully said, uh, which of the following design principles stands to have the best impact on your students? Uh, so they're all gonna have some, but which one in your opinion has the best or the biggest impact? Is it the persistent program overview, that idea that you're always able to track the program? Is it uh, the, Liveness, the immediate feedback, uh, the low floor, high ceiling, the introductory, which is important for uh, advanced concepts. Is it work across visual abilities so that it's inclusive or enable progression, which is going to make concepts and push them forward to other learning opportunities? So pick one, if you would. Which one is the most important, in your opinion, of all of them? Now, as, as you guys are weighing in on this, uh, what we're gonna do at the end is we're gonna bring up this question again. So as Joe and I go through this and we talk specifically about what CodeJumper is and we look at the lessons and you see us working with this, is anything going to change about your opinion on that? So this is sort of the first time that we'll ask this question. And as we wrap up, we'll ask this question a second time and see if, your response is the same or it's changed, okay? So Betsy Ann, I think we've got 50% uh, uh, participation at this particular point in time. You're muted, Betsy Ann. I, yes, I, I got it. Uh, we do have about 61% participation at this time. So keep filling it out and I'll share our early results. So the largest group at 38% selected enable progression. So the ability to take concepts learned through Code Jumper onto other opportunities. 31% selected work across visual abilities. So the idea that it's an inclusive design. 23% selected liveness, the immediate feedback that you get from Code Jumper, and finally 8% selected persistent program overview. So the ability to always track the program and have it in front of you, not have to memorize key steps. So thank you for taking that poll. As Jim said, we're gonna launch it again towards the end of the webinar, but I'm gonna end our poll right now and hand it back to Jim. All right. All right, thanks, Betsy Ann. All right, Joseph, will you take a moment and uh, tell these guys a little bit about what Code Jumper is? Yeah, so thanks, Sully. Uh, Code Jumper is a physical programming language designed by Microsoft and then developed by APH. Um, it's designed to teach coding concepts to students seven to eleven. Um, when I say that, and when we have that here, it does the, that doesn't mean that folks older or younger can't use Code Jumper. 
I've actually seen uh, folks in high school use it in coding clubs. And then I've seen little kids like five to six at a, a school camp, a summer camp here at KSB, uh, utilize it and use it just to kind of play and hear the sound. So, you know, it's kind of been fun for everyone. Um, go ahead and move on to the next slide. All right. So, so how does, how, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Joe, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> so how does Code Jumper work? So it's similar to block, st uh, block style coding, but tangible. Um, so basically what I mean by that is Code Jumper is a physical component. You heard Sully mention that earlier. Uh, so we actually have pods and we have um, like a hub that they, these connect to. So kids can actually get their hands and feel concepts such as loops or such as uh, selection, if, then, and this. It's not just block style coding on a screen that they're having to drag and drop that it, that that the most popular program right now is Blockly. That is, uh, there are some accessibility work going into that, but it's still um, very hard for a blind person or visually impaired person to uh, look at that and understand how the programming language works. So, me myself, uh, when I actually got Code Jumper, I was able to feel how a loop was created. And it just sort of put that picture in my mind of, okay, this is this is what that means. So I, I, I was doing loops for for many, you know, many months at, at that time. Um, you know, I was actually way older. So I had done loops in like video games that I had created um, back in the day. And, but I just had no idea what that concept actually looked like physically. So Code Jumper sort of puts that physical component in your hand. Um, so we have songs, theme stories, custom sound sets. You can do all these within the app and sort of make Code Jumper your own. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay. So where is Code Jumper used? So individual instruction, we have that. So with COVID, we actually had some folks using it at home and utilizing it in the home setting. Uh, the classroom setting, so uh, we had kids using it in the classroom. And the great thing about Code Jumper is it's sort of a tool that sighted and blind uh, kids can play together. It's it's universal in that, you know, everyone's going to want to sort of get their hands on this and learn how to, you know, create stories, create songs, uh, and, and sort of push the max. So it kind of encourages learning together. Uh, we, we encourage um, one kit for every three to four students is kind of what APH and what we found to, to work the best. Um, oh, I've seen this worked, I mentioned earlier camps. So I've seen this at the uh, KSB camp here in the summer and then also at the NFB camps, they've used it. Uh, and then after school programs. So we, we were actually at CES one year and they we had a few people come up to us saying they wanted to use this in after school programs and we've kind of had good feedback for that. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. All right. And I think this is where we're going to see the Sullivan poker table soon. Is that right? Actually, we've we've we've, cha we've changed. We've, we have a new background for for the uh, oh. for the 2022 fiscal year for APH. All right. Be before we go a little bit further, I just I'm going to jump back a couple of slides, and we'll just I want to just sort of come back to this idea of we we talked about this idea of a persistent uh, program overview, liveness low floor, high ceiling, working across visual abilities, and then enabling progression. So as we begin to go through this, be again, looking for, again, the ability for the kids to be able to get that big picture, that immediate response. You're going to see different concepts that are talked about here in the relationship to that low floor, high ceiling as it relates to computational thinking, and then uh, the ability to uh, uh, enable all kids to be able to work through this. And then the concepts, what concepts are, are you seeing here? I think there are a few of you that have said, I'm uh, pretty comfortable with teaching uh, computer coding. I'm you know, very comfortable with teaching computer coding. So what are you gonna see in here that you'd be able to take forward uh, with you? And uh, as we move forward with this, I just had a little uh, message pop up that my internet connection isn't so stable. So if we have any issues, Joe, uh, let, me, let me know if you're having a hard time hearing me. So, the, so Joe, we've got the uh, screenshot here of the Meet the Code Jumper app. So do you wanna go ahead and yep. take a moment to uh, talk about that, um, that app? Yep, so the screenshot you're seeing is actually from our Windows app. Uh, we do have a Windows app, and now we have an Android and Chromebook application. You can run this on Android devices and Chromebooks, as well as Windows. Um, so 
on the screen uh, from the app, it's it's pretty uh, it's laid out pretty nice. It is compatible with all the screen readers, so JAWS, NVDA, Narrator, uh, Chrome Vox, and Talkback all work with this. Um, so we have it laid out on the top. You the first thing you kind of notice is the Bluetooth indicator that that lets you know if you're connected or not to the hub. Uh, we have a musical gear for adding custom custom sounds. And to get to these with a screen reader, you could use the tab button, for example, to go across the top here. Uh, there's a lowercase i for about. And then there's a right arrow for playing the program. And then there's a megaphone for reading the code aloud. And then a square to stop the program. Uh, below the little menu bar that I just kind of went over is four threads of code. So you can see thread one, two, three, and four. Uh, those are, when we talk about the hub here in a second, those are going to line up with the adjacent uh, ports on the hub. Um, and that is pretty much it for the app. Um, the app does work with Bluetooth. Um, so you would connect your hub uh, to this app. So that's why that Bluetooth gear at the top is there. So now we're going to go ahead and get into the actual code jumper kit. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment, and then I am going to reshare, and I'm going to bring up my camera, and um, there's a bit of washout that's going on here. I threw some paper below this. We did a little run through a little bit earlier, and I think that's partially due to the fact that we don't have some of the other uh, uh, pods that are up here, but the first one that we have up here, Joe, is the uh, is the hub. And so, if you want to go ahead and describe the hub, I'll bring my hand in, which will bring a little bit more definition to the the actual object. Yep. So the hub is the brains of the unit here. So this is a ultimately a Bluetooth speaker, but it also has. Uh, so you have a, a dial on there for the sound to turn it up and down. You have the play pause button, which is triangle. And you have a stop button, which is square. And you also have the four 3.5 jacks for uh, the different threads. So those would, would actually, uh, you know, thread one, two, three, and four. It's where you're going to plug in the different pods that we're going to talk about here in a second. This does run on AA battery. Uh, so that those plug in through the, or those would actually be inserted on the bottom of the unit. Uh, so there's a battery lid. And um, that is kind of it when it comes to the hub. Okay. Now, one thing I want to say before we move into the actual play pods is everything with Code Jumper is distinguishable by touch. I say that because I don't, I'm not actually going through the kit in front of me. Uh, Sully's going through it and showing you guys what uh, each part is. But as a totally blind individual like myself, we can identify each part just by feel alone. Uh, and if you're low vision, Everything has a different color, or maybe may not maybe the same color, but may have a dial or not have a dial. So there, so there's definitely differences to each piece that you'll be able to definitely uh, tell apart by touch or by sight. Uh, so getting into the different pieces of the hub, the first should be the play pod. Is that what you got, Sully? That's what I have. Yeah. Awesome. So we have eight of these. Uh, we have on the play pod. You have a 3.5 uh, male end that plugs into the hub itself with a wire that leads up to the pod. And on the pod, it has two dials. There's a donut shaped dial. That is going to be your sound dial. And there's a taller dial. That's your going to be your duration or speed um, dial. So you would turn these dials to, for example, the donut shaped dial. If you turn that, that's going to go through the different sounds in a sound set that you select on the application. So moving on, we have a pause pod. You get three of these. This has an orange dial. And this, the dial actually controls how long, uh, basically, you're going to have a pause duration. So uh, within the app, when you turn the dial, you can set this to pause for a beat or a fourth of beat or you know something like that. So you would just put this on your thread of code, and it would create a little pause. Then we go to the loop pod. Um, so this is, it's a yellow, it has a yellow dial. Uh, and it has two cords on it. Uh, so you can actually create a loop. I was mentioning earlier um, that I was able to feel the loop. So with this, you can create a sequence of code that loops for a set amount of numbers. Then one of the reasons we're here today, the selection dial, the selection pod, it's green. 
Uh, it's got two gear dials. So this is kind of the if then then else uh, pod. So you can control if, some, if a number is greater than or less than that it'll play this sound or play that sound. So you kind of do a lot of stuff with this. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna hammer into this in a, in a few minutes here. Then we have a merge pod. So this is green, but it has no dials. Uh, this merges different threads of code together, ultimately. And then we have different plugs. We have uh, different plugs here in the, in the kit. And all of these are, again, distinguishable by touch. So we have constant uh, plugs. They are one through eight. So you can feel which constant plug you're actually going to put on there by the number on the actual plug itself. We have the random plug, which has the, it's an R on it. We have an infinity, which is the kid's favorite one to use when playing code, uh, especially when they find a, a, a rather um, annoying sound <laughs> uh, from my testing with kids. Um, so this is the infinity symbol, and that just means it'll play the code for forever until you stop it. Uh, there's counter plugs. So we have a plus and minus. And then we have variable plugs. We have three of those. And then the kit also comes with an extender cable. Uh, so that way, if you're uh, maybe running out of room, you can create a little bit more room on the table. And that is the code jumper kit. I think we got all, right. all the parts there. Good. All right, I'm gonna do a stop share again. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the lessons. And we've got a question in the chat that says, will the app be available on iOS soon? And I think the fair response to that would be is we should see uh, it be available on iOS in the year 2022. I would say that it would probably be more mid 2022. Uh, we do meet about this monthly, so. All right. We're definitely looking into it and they're, they're working on it, so. Okay. And um, just uh, Betsy, and uh, I am sharing the. Yes. Okay. We've, I just want we've got check. your PowerPoint meet the code jumper app. Super. All right. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the curriculum and the curriculum is available at uh, codejumper.com. The curriculum itself uh, consists of of eight primary lessons and 11 advanced lessons. And all of those lessons are aligned with national academic standards related to computer science. So when we go through this in a bit, you'll actually see uh, one of those standards. Uh, throughout the course of the curriculum, uh, you are, we are encouraging you to have the students to journal to track their progress. So as the kids create the stories and the sounds and songs, there is nothing that can be saved. So journaling is, is very important with that process. And there is no specific guide to the journaling process. And that was intentional. Uh, I2E is the organization that created this. And they very much uh, wanted to keep uh, the whole process of journaling very open-ended. And we actually did, uh, Betsy Ann did a, a wonderful session, I think back in the month of June, on journaling. And so I would encourage you to check the YouTube archives for that session that uh, Betsy Ann helped to lead. And, uh, and so along with the lessons and the journaling, there are two assessments, which essentially are projects. There is a project that the students would do after the, the eight primary lessons. And there is a project that the kids would do after the 11 advanced lessons. There is a rubric that you could use to score those assessments. We'll take this a little bit further. And, um, and so what you'll find when you go into each lesson is, is that along with uh, vocabulary and learning objectives, uh, there is an unplugged offline activity uh, that you can walk the students through. Uh, there is a guided activity that will take the kids through uh, concepts. And then there is an opportunity for that exploration uh, that ability for the kids to be able to work in small groups uh, or to work individually creating tasks and computer programs. So it allows you to be able to get into the, um, the, the computing, um, uh, the exploration as aspect of things. And then there's always a check for understanding. So 
I mentioned those principles at the outset, which the developers at Microsoft, as they were building this tool, they wanted to keep certain things in mind as it related to the kids. But the other thing that they learned as they began to sort of look at this idea of providing a tool that would teach computational thinking in computer coding for young students was is that they needed also to create lessons in such a way to make teachers and professionals that would be working with students more comfortable because they realized that many of the concepts that they were going through would be unfamiliar to uh, someone such as a teacher of the visually impaired. So uh, the, there was a lot of intention and thought that was put into these lessons. And when they were looking at that, they were looking at the standards, but they were also looking at those that would be delivering this and, and making it such that the teachers could be learning along in some instances right along with the students. All right, so let's go a little bit further. Uh, today, we're going to specifically look at lesson 11, which includes selection and random. And so for if you're joining us for the first time, we talk about, again, the idea of low floor, high ceiling. We're getting more into the high ceiling thing. So if you don't know anything about selection and random today, it's okay. We're going to talk a little bit about it. And we're going to model this. Uh, but just keep in mind that all along the way, the students those that we're working would be developing the needed concepts and information to get to this point. And so the learning objective uh, for this particular lesson is to, to develop programs that use selection and random values. And that at the conclusion of this lesson, the check for understanding is that a student can describe what happens when a selection is made that is random. And that is specifically coming out of the CSTA K-12 computer science standards. Uh, and there is a link in the PowerPoint, which I believe you guys will have access to where you can go. And I believe uh, Betsy Ann, you, oh, I think you've already dropped that into yeah, the Yeah, dropped the it chat. in the chat. One step ahead of me as always. Thank you so much. All right, so, so again, uh, that is again the idea and it's specifically developing programs. So the important thing to keep in mind is, is that we will be developing a computer program here momentarily. Uh, now, in those lessons are, are always CodeJumper tutorial videos. So the lessons are gonna tell you specifically what it is that you're going to need in terms of play pods and uh, pause pods and things like that. But in those lessons, you will be able to watch videos that will tell you about the tools that you will be using. And I dropped this slide in here just as a, a reminder to everyone that, that those, those supported resources are in there for those that are using the tool. All right, so now we get into vocabulary. And this is where maybe John Carr will pop up here a little bit and bring some of his wisdom and knowledge. But uh, so, so the idea of a selection, so the vocabulary, there are two, two main vocabulary words in here. Um, and that is a selection is a structure in a computer program, in computer programming, where if a question is asked, the program decides what to do next based upon the answer. So this is sometimes referred to as if then else. And random value is a value that changes in a computer program depending upon the possible outcomes of the programming sequence. So it could be compared to sort of rolling the dice. So John, I'm, I'm gonna ask you a question. So, you know, in the work that you were doing in school, you know, where in your education or how often were you using the idea of selection and random value? Probably almost every lesson. Those things, they're, same with uh, your looping structures. Those things are done countless times in programming. And those you're are random and, values. And you're you're specifically doing that, obviously, all along the line with uh, lines of linear code, correct? Yes. Yeah. And so the idea here with Code Jumper is is bringing in the ideas of selection and random. Uh, into this physical programming language, where again, you know, John mentioned the idea of loops, um, and we did actually loop, there it is, one of our um, sessions a little bit earlier in the year, where the kids are able to actually put their hands onto a loop. So we come back again to the idea of, you know, the intention and the design of this tool 
was for kids to be able to feel the big picture, to see all the parts of the code out in front of them at any particular point in time. So John, I'll ask a, a, a question. So in, in a line of code, you know, how many characters could potentially be in a line of code? Uh, depends on how long you want it. <laughs> Usually I try to keep it to uh, probably no more than 50 characters. 50 characters. But sometimes they get complicated. <laughs> so it can be more. So we go back again to that idea where we were talking about, you know, one of the barriers to jumping into this early is the, the need to keep those 50 characters or those 10 characters or however many characters in your mind and, you know, what comes what. And so the idea, again, as Joe pointed out, was CodeJumper is there as an early starting point for kids that are in elementary school and in, in middle school. So one more time, selection, a structure in, a, in computer programming where if a question is asked, the program decides what to do next based upon the answer, sometimes referred to as an if then else statement. In random value, a value that changes in a computer program depending upon possible outcomes of the program sequence compared to rolling a dice. So if you roll two dice, uh, there are any number of different uh, numbers that could pop up, six-sided dice that is, each time you roll those dice. So that's the random aspect of it. So we move on to our next poll question. Paul? All right. So we wanna see if you were paying attention to the discussion about the vocabulary. So the concept of if, then, else, it's also called what? Is it selection? conditional, random value, or if this, then that. So the concept of if, then, else, it's also called what? Selection, conditional, random value, or if this, then that. So as we're waiting for our responses, uh, I, are there any questions that have come up in the chat that we need to, uh, to address? Only question so far was about iOS. Okay. And when that might be released. We talked about that being a little bit later on in uh, 2022, so. All right, and folks are filling out that poll question. Um, pretty good participation so far. Mm -hmm. um, again, we're quizzing you on a concept you just learned, so take exactly. a stab. <laughs> So why don't we why don't we kick why don't we why don't we ask um, why, why don't we ask our expert uh, the computer programmer that's here with us John um, what is the answer to the question the concept of if then else is also sometimes or is also called selection selection ding 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 all right very good all right. so we're gonna end that poll and hand it back over to you Jim all right we'll keep going all right. All right, so we're here at this point where we're going to do uh, an offline activity, and uh, we do want all of you to participate. All right, so uh, so this and Joe will talk about this in a little bit more detail. I'll read off of the slide. So we're going to bring in some uh, we're going to bring in some technology. We're going to bring in Alexa, and so Alexa will roll six dice uh, five times. All right, so again, Alexa will roll six dice. Uh, five times. And we're going to track the number of times that the number five appears in each roll. And so uh, the number five in each roll. So um, if the number five appears more than eight times, Paul uh, will do this. And that is Paul is going to win. And we know how much Paul likes to win. Yes, Don't we, we do. Don't we, Peter? Yes, we do. Peter very much <laughs> knows how much how much Paul likes to win, right? Super competitive. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so, and if the number of five appears uh, the same or less than eight, then Betsy Ann is gonna win. And we know Betsy Ann likes to win as well. I'm not sure that she likes to win as much as Paul though, right? So, so anyway, uh, so Joe, we I'm may find out you. as well <laughs> <laughs> to describe this in a little more. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, so um, what I'm going to do is one of the key aspects here is, is journaling. So we, we kind of touched on that a little bit 
earlier in the in the webinar here. Um, so how we're going to keep track of these numbers. So for example, I'm actually going to use I'm going to go a little old school here. I didn't I didn't bring my braille display with me today. I got an abacus. So every time the number five is read out, I'm going to put a number five up on the row of beads uh, so I can kind of keep track of how many fives there are. So I'm going to ask the the a lady, I'm not going to say her name yet, uh, how to roll six dice. And we're going to do this five times and we're looking for the number five. Um, so Paul, I'm going to start with you. How are you going to journal today? So I've got notepad open. So I've got a simple notepad file up, quick and easy. Uh, every time I hear five, I'm just going to write a number five down. Awesome. Uh, Betsy Ann? I've got my trusty pen and a notepad. All right. And Sully? Uh, ditto. Ditto to that. Awesome. All right. So let's uh, let's get started. So I'm going to say, Alexa, roll six dice. I rolled six six-sided dice and got two, 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 one, five, and six. All right. So we got one five. Alexa, roll six dice. I rolled six six-sided dice and got. Six, six, three, six, five, and two. All right. Alexa, roll six dice. I rolled six six sided dice and got three, two, five, five, three, and six. It's getting close here. I'm gaining on Paul. That's getting to go. It's right? good. Actually, yeah. yeah. Paul, Paul needs more, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, I need four more. Yeah, I, you, yeah, you're, I need you're, a bunch you're... more. I need a bunch Ooh. of fives. And how many Quickly. times? How many times have we rolled? We got two more. Three. To go. We've yeah, we rolled three, so we have two two more to go. And how many times we've got? Uh, we only four. have four fives so far. We've got four fives. Okay. Yep. Alexa, roll six dice. I rolled six six-sided dice and got five, six, three, four, six, and one. Oh, this is not looking good. <laughs> this is not looking good. Yahtzee. The competitive side. Yeah, I'm just going to do it one more time. <laughs> Alexa, roll six dice. I rolled six six-sided dice and got six, 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 three, six, and two. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank Winner. goodness we didn't go with six, huh? Yeah, because yeah, there was like 12 were. or 15 sixes. There we were lost one, sixes. two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven sixes. So that was the number of the day. Right. So so the idea then is uh, so if if we roll uh 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 six, was it right? If we roll six uh six sided dice, right, five times. How many times will the number five five come up? So 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 that is kind of getting into that that randomness um, of this. And right, we've got we had one, two, three, four, five, um, and and then obviously we were looking for an outcome. So uh, Betsy Ann was the winner. And what what does uh, what does Betsy Ann win today, Joe? What what uh, I you know what we could do is what we could probably do is like maybe what we could have is like somebody like leave their um, uh, the Betsy Ann's recording on her um, on her voicemail. Maybe you could do that for her, like like a, that'd be perfect. Yeah, that calling the winner. Like, exactly right. <laughs> You've reached the winner's <laughs> voicemail box. <laughs> it's Hollywood Hodge here. As Betsy long as it's not, not available today. No. That's right. Very important. All right. Very good. Okay. All right. So I guess we're going to take this now from. Uh, uh, from the from the offline activity now to the online activity, but again, what we were kind of looking to do was to model that for you, and then to just kind of get you thinking about those questions that you would ask, like uh, how would you get the the your students to to um, to m make note of this, and you would be able to again specifically see how everybody would be able to participate in something like that, and think about these concepts of of selection. And, and random, you know, we talked about it being more of a, a higher ceiling and where could we take that on in our computer programmer when we ask the question, you know, how often are you using selection and random, uh, you know, pretty much all the time. So uh, some points we wanted to bring up. So I need to, um, I need to go ahead and I need to stop sharing 
and bring up uh, the CodeJumper app and um, the camera. So you need to give me a moment to go ahead and do that. Yep. I don't so for, for everyone or for anyone who's new to this, um, every lesson that we've kind of covered throughout this webinar series, uh, we look at different lessons. And what's great about the core curriculum that is put together is that each one has a <clears throat> uh, off line activity that you can do with the students. And then we, we're going to get into the sort of the, the online with the code jumper here. Uh, but it's great because it teaches you these concepts as you're going along. So um, just something to kind of, if you, if you are a little confused or maybe you want, maybe you understand this one, but you want to know something about loops, you can go back and watch that webinar and sort of learn the concepts there. So. I think we did say that um, for those of you who do have your, um, your code jumper kits with you and you wanted to, to uh, play along with us, uh, you're going to need uh, four, four play pods. You'll need the selection pod. You're going to need the merge pod and you're going to need the random plug uh, to, to join us. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and turn on my, um, my, my hub here and hopefully uh, we'll see it connect here momentarily to code jumper. And then um, hopefully the sound isn't going to go too goofy on me. Um, it, it doesn't, it hasn't connected just yet. So, and um, so I'll bring up my, um, my selection pod bring up my random pod. I'm going to bring up my, my two play pods here, and then I'll bring up my other play pods here. And let me do this. I'm going to close out of the Code Jumper app, and I'm going to open it up again because we haven't connected yet. So we'll do a little troubleshooting this way. Bring that up. And um, did the sound come through on that? Did you hear the little clicking noise? I didn't hear anything didn't. there. Okay, so no. let me do let me do this. Uh, let me reshare my screen. All right. So, oh, actually, I haven't shared my screen yet. All right, we've got your code jumper, and we've got the app. Bring this over here. And we have a, a little bit of a split screen going on here with this. Okay. All right. Uh, so are we good there? Yes. Okay. All right. So Joe, you want to uh, explain what it is that we're, we're going to do? There'll be a test at the end of this for everybody as well. We're going to ask some questions of the audience. So we'll be looking for some audience participation uh, uh, to uh, drop some answers into the chat. So what we're going to do here is we're going to show the selection pod and we're going to show uh, we're going to work with mainly the random plug as well. So we're going to we're going to basically kind of going to do what we did with the offline activity with Alexa. We're going to um, choose the animal sound set. And if it's greater than or less than the number five, I think we're going to go with um, <clears throat> you're going to hear the basically you're going to hear the app choose one of the two animal sounds that we're going to choose. So we're going to kind of I'm going to get. Uh, Jim set up here. Um, so we're going to go ahead and plug in the selection pod to the hub. Okay. You can put that in any thread. I mean, I, I'm assuming you're going to go with thread one, but just, yep. just in case. I, yep. For everybody who's playing along, I put that into, into thread one. Okay. And awesome. I did hear clicking. Did you guys hear clicking? Yep. Yes. So the, the clicking sound indicates that the connection was made so that that's a good sound. Um, so now that he's got the selection key or the selection pod up, we're going to go ahead and, um, we'll go ahead and keep going. So we'll put two play pods on here. Do you want two play pods on? We're going to put two, one on each side. Yep. One on each side. Okay. So I plugged one in with the three and heard, spokes and then and I'm now the plugging in another one I heard the noise. Uh, with All the right. two spokes. Okay. So now on the Code Jumper app, let's go ahead and choose animal sounds before we do anything else. Okay. So I clicked on and you, this is a totally accessible app. So the kids could go in and select with, uh, with the keyboard. And so I'm gonna go to sample sounds and I'm gonna go to sample sound set and I'm gonna come here to uh, animals. And I'm gonna hit okay. All right. Now, 
<laughs> on play pod one, let's just go ahead and get our animals selected. So on the, the donut shaped dial, let's go ahead and find a dog. A dog, okay. There we go. And let's go ahead and make that just a little faster. So on the, go on the taller dial and just flip it up one. Okay. Whoa. Sounds a little slower. A little Halloween-ish there. A little faster. There we go. A little chihuahua. I like it. Yeah, it turned into a small dog. Yeah. All right. All right. So now on the other play pod, let's get the duck. All right. There we go. And we'll leave him normal speed. Um, so now let's go ahead and play with the selection pod. So this is going to be if the, if then, then else. And I want to kind of look at this first before we add the random component in. So on the two spoke dial, Jim, go ahead and just turn that like one, just so we can kind of hear what the sound is going to do. Three. So you hear the three. Let's go ahead and read that code back now. So go ahead and press both the play and the pause. Okay. Thread one animals. If three is greater than two, play dog for 1.5 times speed. Else, play duck for one times speed. And if, and thread. So that's kind of reading. That's kind of reading the code. So, you know, you know as we're as we're going. So go ahead and um, flip the. Just go ahead to the three spoke and, and flip that up one. Okay. One, two, three, four. Go ahead and go to five. Okay. Five. Now go ahead and read read that back. Okay. Thread one animals. If three is greater than five, play dog for 1.5 times speed. Else, play duck for one times speed. And if, and thread. So this is how you can kind of tell the if, then, then is, <clears throat> if then an else statement. Um, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to take the, the two spoke up to five. Right, I want to go that way. Two spoke up to five. Okay. Yep. Four, five. And then go ahead and take the, the three spoke uh, down. Uh, we'll go, we'll go down to, we'll go down to three on that one. Six, five, four, three. All right. There we go. Now go ahead and, uh, and do, do our, uh, do our, read the code. Okay. Thread one animals. If five is greater than three, play dog for 1.5 times speed. Else, play duck for one times speed. And if, and thread. All right. So what we're going to do here is, is we're going to run the code. And basically, if you hear the, we're going to just kind of keep track of the, Keep track of the duck. Um, we're gonna know. We're gonna keep track and journal how many times we hear the duck played, and what that indicates. Can you read that one more time? Sorry. Yep. Let Thread one animals. Way. If five is greater than three, play dog for one point five times speed. Else, play duck for one times speed. And if, and thread. All right, so, so we're gonna keep track of the duck. Every time we hear that, we're gonna know that basically the number was less than five. So go ahead, Sully, and we're gonna do this five times. So we, we've talked about the journal. So I'm gonna, I got my abacus here. Uh, Paul's got his word pad pulled up and Betsy and Jim got paper and pencil. So we're gonna keep track of how many times out of five times we hear the duck. Well, the, the one aspect of this is that we don't have anything random in here. So we, oh yeah, yeah. Have, sorry. I'm sorry. That, yeah, that's let, right. let, <laughs> I jumped ahead of myself here. So let's uh, go ahead and plug in the random plug. So we're going to add, so we go back to talking about the plugs that we had earlier. I completely duh. <laughs> had a moment here Monday. Uh, we're going to plug in the random into the, uh, go ahead and plug it into the two spoke. And we heard it connect. So now let's go ahead and read the code. Okay. Thread one animals. If random is greater than three, 
Play dog for 1.5 times speed. Else. Play duck for 1 times speed. And if. We'll and thread. We'll still keep track of the duck. Um, so we'll know if it's less than. Um, so we'll, every time we hear the duck, we're going we're gonna to write that down. So we're going to do this five times. Uh, so we, we've just created a random. So now it's going to be basically just the computer simulating. It's going to basically just pick out numbers. And if it's greater than, you're going to hear the dog. If it's less than, you're going to hear the duck. So uh, go ahead and hit play, Jim. All right. All right. Got the dog. All right. So how many times are we going to do this again? We're, we're going to do, do five this times. five times. All right. And everybody's keeping track the same, the same way as we did before, correct? Yep. All right, so we so we heard we heard the dog. So if the random is greater than three, we're going to hear the dog, and if the random is uh, less than three, we're going to hear the duck. Okay. All right. So we're playing that again. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. All right. <laughs> All right. Go ahead and play it again. Everybody keeping track. Paul, are you paying attention? He's still upset about losing. <laughs> you may have lost that. Let me ask the question, Betsy. I'm waiting for the duck so that I can. Yeah. <laughs> wow. All right. And one more time. Oh, the duck kind of catching up there. Yeah. So we got we heard the duck twice, which, as Jim indicated. Um, <clears throat> when we started this here is with the dog, um, it had to be greater than, or it had to be less than uh, five. Is that right? But, yeah, three. Greater, three. Than three. greater than three. Greater than three. three. Yeah, there we go. For the it dog. It had to be greater than three for the dog, less than three for the duck. So every time Jim ran the program, it just picked a number and it picked in, from the random plug that we have plugged in there. And the, the, the program played the sound that associated with, you know, within those two variables. So, um, that is kind of how the selection pod works. And you can make this in a program be, you can actually get a pretty complex program going. So you could, this kind of comes in play if you're building a story or if you're building a certain line of code and you just want something kind of unpredictable or different to happen each time, you can, you can make that happen with the random plug and the selection pod. All right. Um, uh, very good. So if, if we if we just take sort of a moment and just sort of think about uh, some of those those principles that we were, again, talking about uh, before and um, and actually, you know what, um, Joe, I'm going to add our um, our merge pod in here. OK. Yeah. So I'm plugging the merge pod in and we didn't get a click. So we got a click there. And then I'm going to add a couple more play Fine. pods to the end of this uh, to do a little bit on this idea of of kind of tracing tracing the code here. All right. So so now that you've uh, done that, Jimmy, yeah, let's go ahead and trace our code and see what we got set up. So go ahead and press the two buttons. Okay. So as I press these two buttons, I'm just going to move literally physically along the way. So here we go. Oop. <laughs> we got. We got, we got our, we have burp. to show that at least once every code yeah. jump or webinar. So, so when you hear that noise, uh, the burp, basically that means the code cannot, you got invalid code. So, so John's probably ran into this several times when, when developing, you, you get something set up where you think you're going to, you're going to work and then you go to run it somewhere and then it fails. <laughs> so I should burp every time I did that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it made my job fun. fun. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 Apparently we have something set up wrong here, so they would. Uh, let's let's hear what we got at least. Um, try just doing the the two. It, does it work when you do the two at the time at the same time? Yeah, here we go. It's, and it yeah, doesn't it does. like the doesn't like the two doesn't like the two at the at the end. So let's try this. It doesn't. You know what it doesn't like is it doesn't like the the random my or my my merge my merge pod because if I do this thread one animals if random is greater than three. Play dog for 1.5 times speed. Else. Play duck for one times speed. And if. And thread. 
And it might, I might need to actually send this bad boy back in because yeah, we were having some trouble earlier. Yeah, we were having some trouble with this. We were having some trouble with this before. So let's try to. Yeah, get... it's not showing up Red on one the animal. app. If random is greater than three, play dog for 1.5 times speed. Else, play duck for one times speed. And if, okay. and thread. All right. So now let's drop a couple more in there because it seems to not be burping. So let's see what happens now. Thread one animal. There we go. If random is greater than three, play dog for 1.5 times speed. Else, play duck for one times speed. And if, play duck for one times speed. Play rooster for one times speed. And thread. So, yeah, there was, I, I, I think it may again have something to do with how we were plugging in that, that, uh, that, that merge pod at the end. But again, going back again to some of those ideas, uh, we get immediate feedback. And as Joy point, John pointed out, he wishes he had got those burps once upon a time. <laughs> uh, uh, we were able to see all of, all of the code just by sort of physically moving and, and tracking, tracking along. And, um, and irregardless of visual ability, uh, all students would be able to be to be working with this. Uh, so, so just some things to to kind of kind of process uh, with that. So, all right. Uh, so I guess we go we go back yeah. into um, you know what I think what maybe what we could do, Joe, before we go any further, is to to introduce this idea of of custom custom sounds mm -hmm. uh, and how those custom sounds work uh, as sort of a reminder. So, do you want to take a a moment to talk about those custom sounds? Yeah, I'd love to. So custom sounds are something that you can kind of add to make Code Jumper your own and sort of have it be personalized. So you can create a custom sound from any wave or MP3 file and you can add them to Code Jumper. So basically, let's say you wanted to tell your own story. You could have, I don't know, I could, I could actually, you know, record myself eating chips or John <laughs> doing braille buzz sounds. Um, and we could throw them in and I could tell a story with those sounds. So the, the great thing is, is I think Sully actually has some custom sounds, if I'm not mistaken, uh, on his computer, computer already. So you could just add them to the app. And how you do that is you go to, there's a custom sounds button that I mentioned earlier. I don't have the color of it, uh, pulled up. I think it's a gear shaped, uh, musical shaped uh, button. Uh, you would click on that or Three. press enter on that. And you can add, you can, you'll name the sound set. So I, I let's just call it Joe's story. So I would name it Joe's story. And then I could add the different sounds that I want in that story. And then when I get that added, ultimately, when I select that in the program, when I use the duration dial, that's going to go through the different sound sets that I just added. And I can then set up my own story and uh, use that in Code Jumper. And those will save. So the custom sound sets can save through the, you know, on your computer. And, you, and basically, you can have that once you get that saved in there, you can have it all the time. And that also works on the Android and Chromebook app as well. Yeah, so a reminder that the the sounds do need to be wave or they do, do need to be MP, MP3. Um, and there so is, you, yeah, there's one other thing I wanted to mention on that. There's no duration of time, but you do want to be mindful that, you know, obviously if you have a five minute sound clip, you're going to be sitting there a long time uh, <laughs> waiting for that sound clip to finish. So uh, the, you can kind of make it wherever you want, but but be mindful of of, of the time that it's going to take to run that program. Yeah. So I do have the Code Jumper app open right now. And uh, in the area of custom sound sets, there are three of them that I've created. One is called Music Today, one is called Space Battle, and one is called Race Day. If I wanted to add a sound set, I can click on the Add a Sound Set button. There's also the ability to go in and delete a sound. And as I add a sound set or build a sound set, I can add up to eight sounds. Uh, so that is the, the, the number of, of play pods that you would have or uh, at, at any given um, point in time. 
um, in one of your, your codes. So uh, if I wanted to hear, if I wanted to add a, add a sound set, I would just simply click on the button. I would give it a name, like uh, maybe like uh, Astros Baseball. And we could put like sounds in there of uh, the, the Houston Astros hitting a bunch of home runs. Um, so I would click on done. Uh, and then that would add my ad, a, Astros baseball custom sound set. And then I could come in specifically and click uh, for sound number one, the add button, right? And um, then I can hit the add sound file where I could go in and find, find the sound file and then I would be able to to give it a name, like for instance, like trash cans, <laughs> or Jose Altuve knocking another one over the fence. Uh, but uh, when we talk about we talk about specifically, you know, that idea of kids being able to create the idea of making it meaningful uh, specifically to a particular student, you, know, you could, you know, as Joe pointed out, have the kids recording um, themselves. Uh, and then they could, you know, build build stories where you are, you know, introducing these these concepts, and they would essentially be able to build a computer program of themselves, you know, reading their own story, or maybe they'd be reading a story that they were they were familiar with. So well, can we can we choose real fast just your your space just to show them like what the sound like on the duration dial like just just going through or the the sound dial and just hear like what a sound would sound like just just as an example yeah okay so i'm going to go back to the home screen Three. screen uh and i'm going to go into twinkle twinkle and under sound set i'm going to choose custom sounds and under sound set i have music today so that's the one that's that i that that's in there so if i select that then uh, we have a whole new group of sounds and I can go through by twisting the sound dial here to hear those sounds that, so that one's entitled boom chuck. And you know, as I'm turning this, you can't see this cause I don't have my camera on. There's another example of a sound. And again, all I'm doing is just turning the, the sound, the donut shaped, uh, um, knob and now I can do the taller knob which is going to allow me to change the duration so there's half a beat normal speed one and a half and two times on the sound basic and then rocks. these are sounds that Jim actually added himself these are not part of the code jumper uh, sound set so these were these were custom added which is which is really cool so just wanted to point that out one more time so we get into age appropriateness. Uh, some, mm -hmm. some of the sounds, if, you, if you're gonna move from elementary school into middle school and you're using this, it's nice to know that you can fall back to some, some sounds that you can bring in there yourself because uh, we've gotten some feedback that some of the sound sets that are in there would be for younger students. So. All right, Betsy Ann, do we, have, do we have any questions? No questions in the chat. All right, we still seem to have most people with us. We haven't lost just about anyone at this particular point in time. So that's always good. All right. Okay, so I need to go back. Uh, I'm gonna stop share here and I'm gonna do another share screen. And I'm gonna come back over here to screen number two. And I'm gonna resume my slideshow from the current slide. One thing worth mentioning here that we haven't talked about, I just wanna get into it real quickly is that you, so we talked re, uh, way early on about, you know, a code jumper kit being good for uh, three to four students. Um, so one thing about that is with a code jumper, with a code jumper kit, you actually can use more than one set of play pods to create a chain. So for example, the code jumper kit comes with eight play pods by default. If you actually had another code code jumper kit laying around, you could add, let's say five more on. So you could have 13 play pods, uh, you know, on that chain. Now that there is a, basically the most you can get on a chain is 16. So that's, that's kind of the cutoff. So, but you can join two code jumper kits together. I wanted to mention that just because it's, it's a question that comes up from time to time um, and allows you to sort of tell a, a bigger story if you wanted, if you, you know, had multiple code jumper sets. 
Okay, so we have just a, a couple more slides to get through. So I, I'm bringing up this uh, this slide again on the principles uh, behind the design of Code Jumper. We started out by talking about really some of the benefits of, of physical programming tools that that students use and how pervasive they are in classrooms these days. But that uh, if you're going to make those existing physical programming tools accessible, sometimes there are barriers to being able to access those. An example would be uh, needing to use a screen reader, uh, that the screen reader would require that the student need to have touch typing skills uh, to be able to, for, as John pointed out, keep a number of numbers or items sort of in their collective memory and that they, that they may need to have concepts uh, that they haven't currently developed. Um, and all of that to say that, um, that as you're going along, and in fact, we've heard stories about how students uh, have wanted to use CodeJumper, have not been as um, proficient with the use of the keyboard and that they developed their touch typing skills so that they could use CodeJumper more independently and specifically the CodeJumper app. But, but those principles were a persistent overview of the program being able to sort of see the big picture, the liveness, that, that immediate response, that, that low floor, high ceiling in terms of basic concepts to more advanced concepts, uh, the work, work across visual abilities. And that is students with low vision, students who are blind, students with, with, uh, without any visual impairments would all be able to use this. And that these concepts they would be able to take with them elsewhere. And in like, for instance, as John pointed out, uh, they are concepts that he was using nearly uh, every time he began to work on a program. Uh, so obviously, uh, they would be in other programs and uh, courses that the kids would be engaging in down the road. Those were all behind the design of Code Jumper. So we're going to get into a couple of questions here. So here's our, our third poll question, Paul. All right. Thank you there. very much. So we want to know which one of these is a benefit of Code Jumper. Is it you can create your own sound sets? You can create a thread that's up to 16 play pods long. You can use Code Jumper for individual and small group instruction, or is it all of the above? All right. So as those as those answers are are coming in, just a, a couple of questions for for John. Uh, John, uh, before you started with uh, with your degree in computer science. In, in Indiana, uh, did you have any coding courses in school? Did you have the benefit of taking any courses while you were in high school, in middle school or elementary school? High school, I had a uh, HTML course. We made some web pages and whatnot. We did a lot of uh, code uh, flow charts, mostly okay. like flow charts and we didn't learn any code until the HTML class. Okay, and so, did did that interest in um, in in that that course and in your computer science course or co science courses at Indiana did that sort of begin with that HTML course in high school or did it begin earlier than that or later? It began with that high school course. Okay, so I think oftentimes we talk again about that idea of exposing kids to different experiences in school and that those experiences can foster an interest that they would pursue further. Uh, but, you know, uh, when you were in that HTML class, John, how confident were you in your ability to be able to, to do that coding coursework in high school? Did, did that work you did in high school um, like tell you, yeah, I can do this uh, or, I think I can do this, or I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I would be able to do this at the next level. I think it gave me an idea that it, it was doable, and the the uh, the constant flow charts were really hammering in. Like, this is an if statement. This is how looping works, and things like that. But the uh, to tell you the truth, when I came in, I was thinking it was going to be more um, like hardware and less software. And so I got <laughs> a real surprise when I got in there. So, so you thought one thing, the experience was something a little bit different, and you learned something uh, that you took forward with you. Uh, so it, it, you being a part of this is, is, is really perfect because we've talked about these ideas and concepts in previous webinars. And, and really, 
another part of what uh, Microsoft was trying to do with CodeJumper was to expose kids to computational thinking at an early age to give them some idea of what it is and to give them the confidence that uh, there was something that they could do and to encourage them to look to other opportunities to get more information. And uh, really Microsoft did a lot of work with the Torino project early on in looking at about 75 students in the UK. And uh, well, one of the things that uh, they, they really found in that Torino project and the research that they were doing with those, uh, those students was that just that, that uh, the Torino project in CodeJumper gave kids the idea that this was something that they could do, whereas previously they hadn't thought about that. And again, anecdotally, we heard a little bit of that. So um, thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Betsy Ann, um, the answer to our question, looks like we had about 92% uh, of the people respond or are saying all of the above. Uh, so yeah, you can create your own custom sound sets. Uh, you can create a thread with up to 16 play pods so you can combine kits um, and um, you can use CodeJumper for a uh, small group and individual instructions. So, so I guess what we can do, I believe we have one more uh, poll question that I think we want to get to. Actually, it's discoveries. Uh, and then the last question, so Paul. Yeah, we got the discoveries next. And so we've learned that the code jumper lessons, they align with, with academic standards. They allow an educator to teach coding. Doesn't matter how much STEM experience they have, they can teach it regardless. So also physical programming solutions like code jumper, they help STEM education opportunities. They make them available for all students. And code jumper can be used in small group and individual instruction. And then if we wanna go back to that poll question, Yep. We asked you this question earlier. We want to see if your opinions changed any, uh, if you still think the same thing, it's fine. But again, it's a, your opinion, which of the following design principle standards have the biggest impact on your students? Is it the persistent program overview, which means that you're always able to track the program, the liveness, which means you get immediate feedback, low floor and high ceiling, introductory to advanced concepts, Work across visual abilities, meaning it's inclusive or enable progression. It means takes concepts forward to other learning opportunities. Which one is most important to you? Having been through this today, is your opinion the same? Has it changed? Maybe you weren't sure before and now you have an opinion. So um, which one is most important? And so as you guys are reflecting on, on that question, and we've been talking about this for the last hour and a half or so, maybe if you want to drop in, in the chat, uh, maybe anything that you've discovered, uh, did, did, you, did, did the presentation sort of change your, your mind? Obviously, we, we think that all five of them are, are very important, uh, but uh, does one of them bubble up to you and did, did it change? So if you want to throw that in the chat, we'd be interested in any comments that, that you have. And, um, and so we'll, we'll allow people to maybe throw some things in the chat as we, again, talk about some of the resources. So is that going to be me that's going to do that? Or is that going to be Paul or Betsy? And is that going to be you that's going to take us out here? Uh, Jim, if that, if that wants to be you, we can go ahead. All right. Yeah. Uh, do we want to check in on this poll first? We've had sure. about 57% participation, so keep filling it out. Uh, but as it stands so far, uh, we still agree 55% say the uh, greatest benefit is that it enables progression, the idea that you're going to take those skills with you. 27% say it works across visual abilities, so it's inclusive. It has that universal design component. 18% say liveness, the immediate feedback. We definitely got to experience that in our uh, plugged-in activity when we got the burp, and it helped us locate where the problem was as we kind of worked towards a solution. So thank you guys for participating in that poll again, and I hand it back to Jim. Okay. All right. So it doesn't look like anybody's chiming in on whether or not um, uh, over the course of the last hour and a half, they've given any more thought again to that idea of, um, of what's kind of uh, most important to their students. So we'll go out here uh, with resources, uh, codejumper.com. 
uh, would be a place where you can get more information. Uh, code.org uh, would be another place for information on coding. Uh, K12.cs.org, uh, csteachers.org, and CS for all are all helpful resources that you can take uh, with you. And, uh, and so CodeJumper is obviously available through, through the American Printing House for the Blind. It is $7.95 on quota and $9.99 uh, for, for non-quota. Uh, I want to thank you for being here with us. Uh, Joe, appreciate your input.